Richard, it's a real pleasure to be able to have this time with you. It's been an amazing, amazing experience downstairs for three weeks. I'm deeply, deeply grateful for the generous offer that you gave me to come down, knowing that I said I wasn't chasing a job. And well, you've more than fulfilled the offer. Oh, it'll be sad to see you go. Thank you. Definitely become a, a member of WETA. So. Thank you so yeah. much. And to the headmaster, there'd definitely be a job here for Ange if, uh, <laughs> if you weren't such a... Uh, such a good place to be working. So. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. And I think, you know, in that respect, Richard, it's been a generous offer because, you know, I didn't have an agenda to, to try and chase a job. So. No, you got, I mean, we we're approached a minimum of five times a week by people asking exactly the same question. And you got here because of your affable and easygoing nature, the fact you came down and saw me and impressed on me that you were a cool person. <laughs> a lovely, sweet, kind hearted, easygoing Kiwi. And that's why you're here. Uh, you know, I, I've I've got a lot out of it. It's been a pleasure having you around. You know, Wet is like a big family. We have our spats just like a big family does. But at dinner, everyone comes back and eats together. And you know, that's what it's about. This place and uh, people that have their gripes and grumbles, but they keep coming back. You know, so it's amazing. It really is. One of the things that I've been asked is what have, what have I got from it. And um, one of the key things is that the whole culture of Weta, you've just got such an amazing team of obviously creative people to be here, but um, their commitment, and uh, I've just been astounded and, and have such a deep respect for those people working for you, for you too, the hours you keep and the investment of energy, and um, it's just huge. And so that's one of the many things I walk away with. But this is about you, so I'll steer this back to you. Um, Richard, can you just briefly tell tell us a little bit about what WETA is in today's market? WETA is an effects facility, first of all. People think that we're a film company, but we're not. We're actually a manufacturing company that happens to be making really cool and creative things, primarily for the film industry. But we will pursue work in any creative field if it gives the artists and technicians at the workshop a rewarding experience. So whether that be children's playgrounds, museums, theatre, film, television, uh, uh, theme parks, who knows what, 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 what's on offer in the future. But as long as it is a creatively rewarding opportunity, we'll pursue that work. Right, that's great. Yeah, and I've seen such a variety of things happening downstairs exactly. Just um, yeah, quite diverse projects taking place. Mm. Yeah, at any one time. Right now we have uh, 11 separate projects on the go. Um, including four major feature films and uh, all of them offer myself and the team around me this wonderful opportunity to express ourselves creatively, challenge ourselves technically and um, hopefully stamp our mark on the world stage. Richard, to get where you are today, um, you've, you've obviously uh, been a child at some stage, you've grown up, you've had experiences, maybe people who have influenced you, um, you've obviously had uh, a natural talent and ability that's been fostered maybe by yourself. Can you share a little bit about how you got to be where you are? From, from well, somewhere? I'm a child still today, 41 years old, I can still, I feel an unabashed enthusiasm to communicate my my thrill of the ride, this incredible opportunity that's been gifted to me in the career that I've ended up in. Um, of course, it's not accidental. It's all about a very careful, thought out and planned journey. For, for me, a lot of people don't know where they're going until they're in their early 20s and take on a tertiary education that may not necessarily cater to their own specific wishes. But for me, from about the age of 10 or 11, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't know the film industry existed. I was growing up in a small country community in New Zealand, uh, but I knew that I wanted to uh, I wanted to make things for a living. I wanted to do something creative, something with my hands. As a child, I just loved making things, making models, sculpting clay, building paper mache creatures. I wasn't academic, I wasn't very, very, particularly very clever uh, academically, and um, but I, I knew that I wanted to make things. Now I had my greatest fortune was to meet my partner uh, in life at the age of 13, and um, meeting her and um, understanding that we wanted to spend our lives together and committing to each other at that early age 
uh, meant that we could focus on what we wanted to do as a career. And at about the age of 15, um, we both agreed that one day we'd own a really cool workshop to make things. We didn't know what those things were, or we could think it would be sort of like my dad's shed, just at a bigger level. And that's what we set about to do. And by, um, by 19 or 20 years old, we had our first workshop and uh, have run a workshop together ever since for 20 years now. And at the end of the day, the building you're in is just like a big Kiwi shed. That is, that's remarkable. That is a remarkable story to, like you say, to have met someone and you know, you're together and, and all of this has come and from such a like, young age and to have a vision like that, that is just amazing. Yeah, wow. I, um, I knew very early on that my career could never lay in a scientific or academic career yeah. uh, and, um, and therefore I had to uh, pursue this burning passion that I have there's no doubt I'm not a gifted person. Uh, there's a real difference and it's an important thing for young people to identify because around them they will experience gifted people and they will try and judge themselves against that gift. There's a difference between talent and gift and in Weta there are a large number of extremely gifted people where the, the craft falls from their fingertips. They barely need to consciously think about what they're doing and the artistry is made at the tips of their fingers. Where us mere mortals, like myself, and potentially like yourself, but like 90% of the workshop, there's talent, but talent driven by hard work. Mm -hmm. And for me, everything I've been able to achieve is put down to a basis of just sheer dogmatic mm -hmm. hard work. Um, we have, without question, worked two lifetimes in our, in our 20 years of work and um, unless you are immensely gifted any walk of life and any career will never come to you easily especially in today's competitive world so it's about settling down to some really solid work and therefore in answer to one of your later questions what attributes do we look for in people who want to join us here at Weta? We have 50 portfolios a week sent to us uh, we've got seven and a half thousand on file for about eight new positions a year. And if I rank them, how I rank them is we look for passion, enthusiasm, tenacity, and then talent. Because without passion, it doesn't matter how talented you are, you can be the most talented person in the world, but without passion you're not going to be able to drive your, your, um, your, your right. talent. Enthusiasm comes second. Enthusiasm is a different thing to passion. Passion is driven from the heart. Mm -hmm. Enthusiasm is the intent of that heartfelt passion. So we have to find people that can turn their passion into an active medium of work. Tenacity is mm -hmm. the third one and, the, and very, very important. That's just the get up and go. Just yeah. give it a go and stick with it. As you've seen downstairs, Frankie has been making trees for four weeks. Yeah. We have people hand assembling chain mail for three and a half years, yeah. 12 and a half million links of it. That is tenacity. That's been able to lift your mind out of the minutia of the job and understand that the opportunities you've been given are worthy of that tedious work. And then finally, the fourth thing is talent. Mm -hmm. Because we're not looking for people, people think that talent means that you can draw well or you can sculpt well. Our engineer has great artistic talent. Our seamstress has great artistic talent. You don't have to be a traditional artist to be able to use your craft. It's very interesting, as you would have experienced, and I have, and all the teachers that work with you, the parents of your, of your students, but the students no longer hear this. We were told that there's no future in the arts. Mm -hmm. But of course, that is complete Hokum, because every single thing that you touch, wear, drive in, sit on, draw with, look at, watch, other than Mother Nature, has been touched by an artistic hand. Mm. So for a young student coming through a secondary school education, if they have any artistic inclination in their minds, their hearts and their hands, then the way to follow their future is to pursue the arts because the breadth of opportunity is as big as the world. 
Um, that leads me actually right into an, another question that I had about what qualities and skills do you think are going to be important in the future for students seeking employment in creative ventures? Because it's a really different world, it's a very visual society today. And you know, they talk about um, people graduating these days that they will have up to sort of eight different career moves in what we traditionally or our um, previous generations have had one or two in, in their lifetime. And how, how do we uh, how do I, as a teacher, make way for, for that? How do okay, I well, I, I, I visualise it very simply. One of the great concerns of a traditional education is a class of 33 students are driven each year to an academic pass mm -hmm. in an exam-based mentality. So the student's primary undertaking through the year is to get to the end of the year with enough, not knowledge, but enough mechanism to pass the exam. Mm. Passing the 50 percentile becomes all important to advance up the next rung of the ladder. You may say, so what? The problem with that is our country is based on one thing more than any out, anything else, and that's innovation. We're an innovative nation of people. But the problem with the, the, the contradiction in terms that we're finding is that, I have a little saying, the art of innovation is to throw yourself at failure and miss. How can a young person risk failure in the pursuit of innovation on the possibility that they won't meet their exam mark and step up the next run? If Richard Pierce, arguably the first man in the world to ever fly, was anxious of failure, would he have ever built an aeroplane? Exactly. Would Hamilton Jet ever have built the jet engine? Could Rutherford have ever split the atom if he was so fearful of the peer exactly. pressure of failure? Yeah. And of course the greatest example uh, in Sir Edmund Hillary, would he have ever mm -hmm. climbed the mountain if he thought there was a possibility, a faint, faint possibility he wouldn't be able to get there? And uh, we have to be very careful as, uh, as uh, caregivers, as tutors, as teachers, that we don't um, strip away the, the freedom of a young mind to explore um, uh, failure, risking opportunities to broaden their visual and artistic horizons. Right. And, uh, and I see that being a primary turning point in the future of our country, if we can pull back and give our students um, and our young people that freedom. Yeah. Room to explore, to experiment, to create, to fail, to try again. To live. Yeah, absolutely. You can't live when you're fixated about the 50% yeah. percentile. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. That is absolutely fantastic. And I've seen that downstairs just everywhere, that um, the whole innovative problem solving, um, how do we get around this, what are we going to do, and just that a marvellous number eight wire kind of mentality of, hey, I know, and um, teamwork and people coming together to, to see a way around something. It's, it's Less than 10% of those people have a tertiary education at what they do. Does that make them less viable as members of New Zealand community, less viable as a taxpayer, as a community builder, as, as family people, as mortgage owners, as... Of course not. Absolutely. It's about identifying that in a classroom of young students, in your case young boys, there are going to be vitalised, energised, inspired leaders of tomorrow that may not be able to pass a maths exam, that may mirror right till they're 11, that may struggle to yeah. verbalise their emotions, but their spatial and creative thought may be the future of tomorrow. And uh, I'm certainly a living example that if I'd been written off because of my shortfallings academically and hadn't been, my, my freedom artistically was almost accidental because they didn't know quite where to put me at school, um, I was able to go and hide in the back of the art class and, um, and uh, ultimately did 5th, 6th and 7th form art as the first student at the school to do that, uh, but in turn was able to just freely explore uh, my own um, uh, world uh, creatively and that um, has allowed me to feel like I have the ability to run somewhere like this. That's, that is just tremendously encouraging, that's great. I think what you've said is practical, it's, um, it's real wisdom and um, 
it, you know, it just, again, just reminds me of the huge uh, potential I've got and why I'm passionate about what I do. And um, again, just to give those boys in my care, in technology and art, just room to play, to innovate, to explore, to make mistakes. And um, it's, a, it's a fine balance between suppressing the unruly <laughs> and allowing, you know, allowing the explosion of energy that yeah. leads to growth and personal expression. Yeah. And uh, we find it here. We've obviously got a maturer, older group of people here, but people are still joining us at the age of 16 to start their career at Weta. We've got people that joined us at 16 that are now, have been with us for 17 years with families and mortgages. Yeah. and. Yeah. and to put in too much, uh, too too high a level of um, of expectation and doctrine and control uh, can crush creativity at such an alarming speed. So, as you've noted in the workshop, other than running and smoking in the workshop, there's almost no there's almost no rules. Yeah. You're not allowed to use abusive language with each other. But other than that, it's a total free expression with the understanding you cannot turn it on like a tap. Yeah. You're not going to be judged on your creative productivity on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You may be judged on a monthly basis, but um, mm -hmm. because people will find their own output. And the moment mm -hmm. that you, are, you start uh, judging it against others, you're once again trying to pigeonhole everyone into a single box. And Kiwis aren't like that. We've been given the freedom to be individuals by this incredible country that we're blessed to live in. And in turn, uh, we must make sure that the young people of the country continue to get that blessing. Great example is um, the student loan scheme. Mm. What an incredible way to crush a person, a, a young person that's trying to enter society dump a huge debt on them, Absolutely. where you and I Absolutely. and all your, your peers went into the community having been paid to go through school. Absolutely. And, um, and or at least through your tertiary education. Mm. And that is a, um, what a way to hobble a first world country and yeah. turn it into a banana republic. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, our, our good people take off, our young people just take off and need to, to earn dollars elsewhere and pour that young energy elsewhere. That's why you would have noted that we carry people even if we don't have work. People are aghast at that. It must cost us. Of course it does. It empties the coffers. But if there's not work here, or if they're not kept here between jobs, where are they going to go? They're going to go overseas. And then that incredible wealth for New Zealand of these unique individuals is given to another country. Richard, I've got some questions that um, I know the boys would, would love to have some answers to. What what would you say, if you could pin it down to one, uh, your favourite film that Weta's contributed hugely to to date, what would that be? Well, without question, we, we've got to work on probably 20 films over our career. All of them have been enjoyable. All of them have been incredibly enriching for me. Um, but without question the most life-changing experience for me at a professional level was Lord of the Rings. To be standing on that on that precipice um, at, at the age I was and to be offered uh, to have, have been offered the opportunity to work on Lord of the Rings and take on the departments we did, you're teetering at this edge <laughs> and you have to step out into the unknown and that unknown went on for seven and a half years. Uh, we ultimately made 48,000 separate props here at the workshop, and with only one sixth of our crew having ever worked on a film or TV show before. But you step off that precipice with the confidence that in this country of unique New Zealanders, you can take a, an inexperienced crew on a journey that where they feel so self-empowered that they will rise to the occasion and do the work that you saw in the film. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the proof is ultimately in the pudding that that film was made by a relatively uh, new industry. And um, it's, it's 
beauty and its technical skill and its verve is testament to a community of filmmakers here in New Zealand. It was just breathtaking. I mean, it's just been incredible as a total outsider who's gone along to the movies um, who just thought, okay, well, let's see see what, what we've done here in New Zealand. And it's just amazing. It's so rich. It's the degree of excellence that Peter Jackson brought to his director and then Weta supported with the props. Um, it's just unbelievable and I guess where do you go to from there? I mean I know every, there's such a question you've been asked from so many interviews from around the world. Well, where do you go? Where do you step to from having done the Lord of the Rings? Well you do, you do move on because yeah. uh, it's about the challenges of the job and King Kong was exponentially more challenging than Lord of the Rings and uh, people said to us often, oh Gollum, Gollum was so difficult, Kong's going to be easy, <laughs> surely. Yeah. But of course, there's a specific difference in those two characters, where Gollum was technically very, very difficult, but he had the use of human language to communicate his emotions, unlike Kong, right. who of course is an animal, and he doesn't have the uh, speech to communicate. So he has to communicate completely through his body movements and his facial articulation with the knowledge, of course, that he has to play at an equivalent level to a Naomi Watts opposite her on screen. And if the audience ever questioned for a moment that Kong wasn't real, the movie would collapse. So that challenge alone is a wonderful thing. Going on to Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the armour and weapons on that were technically far more challenging than what we got to do on Lord of the Rings, primarily because of the incredibly shortened time schedule. Right. And so there was a need to uh, build up a momentum and a technical expertise to pull them off. Richard, um, what, where to for we to then? Where do you think for the next five years, the next 25 years? I know that you can't necessarily predict that far out, but... Oh, no, no, I know, I know where I want to... Um, where we hope to go, uh, we we believe, uh, Tanya and I believe, our future lies very much in uh, our ability to grow our own intellectual property opportunities. We've set up a number of other businesses, the collectibles you can see on the walls around you is a business that we've set up that runs uh, arm in arm with our film work. Uh, we've set up a publishing arm to publish our own books. Uh, a children's television production company and we've just completed the first 26 episodes of our own TV show uh, called Jane and the Dragon. All of this is in an attempt to get to a place where we're not only servicing other people's ideas and work as we do on the films we make, but we can generate our own ideas here in the workshop, right. develop them here with the young people in the workshop, take them out to the world, sell them to the client, and then get to make them. Because only when we get to that place does New Zealand truly, or do we feel that we truly own our own industry, where we're self-generating the intellectual property, funding it from New Zealand, making it with New Zealanders, and then returning the, the, um, the, the, the rich opportunities from a merchandising and uh, business opportunities back to New Zealand. And that's where we hope to take the company in the coming years. That, uh, that's great. That is, like, that's fabulous. It's in-house, it's New Zealand, and all the wet wannabes that I know exist out there who are only you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age have, have got potential in a future. Then. Uh, every young can, person that know. writes their own story, that designs their own character, the dreams of their own fantasy world, is arguably the instigators of the next um, feature films or television shows or theme parks that we will all enjoy in the future. It's fantastic. And I know I've got uh, another um, question, if we've got time for this, um, that, another couple actually, that are quite interesting. If you weren't heading Weta, what other career choice would you think that you'd like to make or could okay. you learn now? I, I know there's only one thing I would... I, I feel extremely lucky. We, we, as a community of New Zealanders, are extremely lucky. Every every person in this country that doesn't appreciate that is missing something. We're probably in the top five percentile of the world 
for standard and health of living and the country that we live in, the opportunities it offers. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things is in New Zealand, you can wake up on Monday morning, decide that you want to be the Prime Minister, and if you work towards it, you ultimately can achieve that. It doesn't relate to the stature of your family, to the aristocracy of your community, and so on, where you sit in the class structure of the country. Right. Uh, any young person can choose to pursue something and achieve it if they have enough internal drive. And, um, and therefore, we... Um, we, I'm going to have to stop, I've got your bloody question. So. <laughs> About another career choice, what you would uh, be so, doing. And, um, and therefore, I, but, but as well as being blessed to actually live and work in this country, I live and work in an amazing city and work in an amazing industry where every day we're creating wonderful things. We're making models for a living. I build miniature trains for a living. <laughs> for monsters. pleasure, for pleasure. And for pleasure. But uh, if I wasn't doing this, what I would want to be is a freelance sculptor. I would like to do fine art sculpting. I'd probably do figurative and, um, and uh, sculptural bust work where I'd sculpt people's likenesses and right. um, you know, marble carving, bronze casting, wow. that sort of stuff. And Richard, um, finally, one of the questions that I know was asked of me from the boys, because uh, I had alluded to the fact that when I met you in June that you'd said you'd been a boarder at a school as well. You'd been boarding. No, I, ha I wasn't oh, went... that. No, I went to a boarding school. Oh, but I apologise. We, yes. we lived on a farm just down the road, so I actually was a day boarder. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, just your experiences, can you? did you have uh, a teacher that you, you can recall who was good for you? Do you have... An embarrassing moment, your proudest moment. Um, yeah, I I wasn't I wasn't particularly happy at school um, because um, our school was focused on um, agriculture, rugby, um, Maori studies, and all I wanted to do was make models and do art. But thankfully, in my fourth form. A, a teacher came along called Mrs. Burrows and um, she was working as the social studies teacher but she also wanted to pursue a career in art and um, I had obviously been noisy enough about this that um, the school thankfully set up an art class so in the fifth form I was uh, able to do art with Mrs. Burroughs as my teacher. I was the only student doing art. Wow. And uh, so I had a one-on-one -on -one, uh, <laughs> teaching opportunity. And each week we'd hop on the bus and go up to Auckland. Oh no, she'd actually give me a lift. We'd go into Auckland to life drawing classes together. And so we, we sort of developed together, her as my teacher and me as a student, learning. And, um, and that carried on through the sixth and seventh form. And uh, I remember her very fondly as someone that was able to assist me um, and help me understand what, what opportunities were out there for someone that wanted to do art. And um, you know, a variety of other people that sort of come through your life that you um, respect and watch and uh, study and understand. Um, and ultimately I ended up making my schooling um, meet my expectations and, and ultimately that's what school should be about. Uh, if you just slot into the system and just take what's offered, um, then you are doing yourself short. So I managed to manoeuvre the course to match my, my, my secondary school um, schooling to, to meet my expectations. And when I went on to Polytech to do graphic design, uh, similarly I was able to um, convince the tutors that um, if my if that I would be able to do most of the graphic design um, um, projects in a three-dimensional way. So by the third year, I did every single exercise as either a sculpture or a piece of model making or something that suited my talents and uh, all respect to them because they allowed me that freedom because they could see that I would grow if I was allowed to do that. Mm. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, Richard, it's been amazing. I could ask you a million questions, but I know your time is hugely, hugely mm. important. Cool. I've got something to give you Ooh. from from the Bay, because I know you are very, very fond of the Bay and look forward to you coming up. And so this is, of course, just the weeniest of tokens. Thank it's you. Good Hawks Bay wine for you and Tanya and a card and um, like I say there's nothing that could ever repay what you've given to me to be here for three weeks and well you can be repaid you can repay us by coming back again awesome. coming back and joining us again you should bring your family down for a visit sometime it's yeah. just been incredible I'm just so deeply deeply moved and grateful for the experience oh good on you oh that's so nice thank you yeah cool it's great